everybody and welcome back to Design Disquisitions where I discuss all things related to intelligent design, evolution, biology and science. It can be agreed by everyone that science should be responsive to new data and changing evidence, but it should always be cautious and conservative. There are several instances in the history of science where some scientists have claimed to have discovered theory-defying, earth-shattering evidence. But when the excitement subsides and cooler heads prevail, it more often than not turns out to be a false alarm or a piece of data that isn't quite as dramatic as initially thought. For the most part, science progresses incrementally, sometimes mundanely and at a seemingly slow pace. Other times there are genuinely exciting discoveries that force us to seriously reassess previously held theories and adjust them accordingly. The natural world is certainly a surprising place and we should never underestimate what we might discover. But in science we should also uh, let the dust settle before making significant changes. Intelligent design theory on the surface makes strikingly bold claims. Among its claims are that intelligent causation played an essential role in the history of life and that science has the ability to detect the after effects of intelligence with the implication being that nature can't be explained solely in terms of material mechanisms. This means that science needs to add or at least, at least acknowledge intelligent design as part of science. Some commentators object to design explanations by alleging that they violate key theory shaping principles, for example, scientific conservatism. In his paper, Two Bad Ways to Attack Intelligent Design and Two Good Ones, Philosopher of science Jeffrey Kopersky formulates scientific conservatism in two parts. The first aspect of this principle is epistemic conservatism. This is the view that unless a better explanation is available, one should remain within one's current belief system. The other part of scientific conservatism is W. V. Quine's principle of minimal mutilation, which states that when accommodating new data, one should make the smallest change possible. Kopersky elaborates that when faced with anomalous data, scientists prefer incremental change over more revolutionary change. He then goes on to argue that ID is an unnecessarily radical proposal, and to accommodate anomalies in biology, we needn't make such a drastic change. As stated, I believe it's almost trivially true that scientists should exercise caution, and I think scientific conservatism is a sensible rule to abide by. But here I want to argue that ID doesn't violate these core values. With regard to epistemic conservatism, the idea of only changing theory if a better alternative is available, it can be disputed that logically speaking this isn't necessarily true. It's perfectly possible for a consensus theory to turn out to be false and yet there may exist no plausible alternative explanations. Should scientists continue to cling to a failing theory just because there's nothing else on offer? In principle, no. However, in sociological and practical terms, scientists always need something to work with. It may be unreasonable to expect scientists to reject everything previously held in a theory and start from a completely clean slate. And after all, rightly or wrongly, scientists have to go where the funding is. Having said all this, ID theorists are proposing an alternative and better theory. They're claiming that modern naturalistic theories of evolution should be abandoned or at least supplemented because design offers a better explanatory framework. As for Quine's maxim of making the smallest possible adjustment to our theories to accommodate new data, does ID in fact go a step too far? Kopersky notes that there's a live debate going on between biologists about the various mechanisms of evolution. Perhaps at first glance this provides support for the claim that neo-Darwinism is an inadequate theory, otherwise why the need for debate? But does this debate among biologists pose a problem for ID? Because it shows that there, there's a broader range of views to consider. Kopersky and several others, no doubt, thinks it does. They argue that the choice isn't just between neo-Darwinism and design because there are many naturalistic non-Darwinian proposals that have been advanced. 
Because these alternative proposals are said to smooth over the explanatory gap that neo-Darwinism leaves behind and still retain a naturalistic approach, these theories are to be preferred because they don't introduce superfluous explanations of a different category, namely intelligence. Kopersky points out that even if orthodox neo-Darwinism collapses, design obviously is not the only alternative. I agree, but having alternatives is not enough. We need good alternatives. Kopersky seems to take it for granted that these alternatives are fit for the job. And though I don't wish to take it for granted that they are, they're not, I think ID theorists have made some good challenges to the proposed alternatives. In Darwin's Doubt by Stephen Meyer, he dedicates several chapters uh, examining alternative theories of evolution, and he finds them wanting. He concludes, Clearly, standard evolutionary theory has reached an impasse. Neither neo-Darwinism nor a host of more recent proposals punctuated equilibrium, self-organisation, evolutionary developmental biology, neutral evolution, epigenetic inheritance, natural genetic em engineering, have succeeded in explaining the origin of the novel animal forms that arose in the Cambrian period. Yet all these evolutionary theories have two things in common. They rely on strictly material processes, and they also have failed to identify a cause capable of generating the information necessary to produce new forms of life. Similarly, Michael Behe writes that a few scientists have suggested non-Darwinian theories to account for the cell, but I don't find them persuasive. In other works, Michael Behe does examine some of these mechanisms in detail. In the 2017 book, Theistic Evolution, Stephen Meyer, Angager and Paul Nelson write, while many of the new mechanisms described by proponents of the extended evolutionary synthesis describe real biological phenomena, including phenomena not captured by neo-Darwinism, each of these proposed new mechanisms still fail to explain the origin of genetic and or epigenetic information necessary to produce new forms of animal life. For a detailed analysis of these mechanisms, you can read the rest of the chapter. So, ID theorists have surveyed the post-Darwinian world, including the extended evolutionary synthesis and so-called third-way proposals, and they have found them unsatisfactory to say the least. In 2016, many proponents of design attended the widely reported New Trends in Evolutionary Biology conference at the Royal Society, where evolutionary biologists passionately debated different accounts of evolutionary change. So I think it's clear that design theorists have a sufficient understanding of the various options out there, and they have made efforts to, to assess them and their relation to design. In the end, they argue that any theory of evolution that doesn't include design is bound to fail, and that alternative naturalistic theories suffer similar problems to neo-Darwinism. These alternative proposals don't turn out to be problematic for ID. The main re reason given for rejecting ID, though, is not just that alternative views exist, but that they are more conservative than design. According to him, if any one of them is capable of resolving the problems posed by complex structures and macroevolution, ID is a more radical solution than is needed. This is of course true, but it depends on the if, and it's increasingly difficult to make the case that these theories succeed. More importantly, as I've pointed out, design theorists contend strongly that they don't, because they fail to account for the origin of complex specified information. As to the cl claim that ID violates conservatism, I would argue that it is in a sense a scientifically conservative position at the same time as being quite revolutionary. Marcus Ross argues that ID is classified as a philosophically minimalistic position, asserting that real design exists in nature and is empirically detectable by the methods of science. As many have pointed out, ID is a broad tent carrying with it very little metaphysical baggage, despite the fact that it might sit better within a theistic framework 
than a naturalistic one. Furthermore, fortunately, ID doesn't require us to completely throw out the insights of evolutionary biology. Benjamin Weicker notes that Darwinism is too small to fit the facts it claims to explain, but ID is large enough to include a modified form of Darwinism. To say that scientists must make the smallest possible theory change to accommodate new data is not to say that the change must necessarily be small. Though the jump from naturalism to design may seem significant, it could be the case that this is the smallest possible change of theory we can make to successfully account for the data. Essentially, though nat naturalistic theories are more conservative, they turn out to be too conservative, sacrificing explanatory adequacy on the altar of simplicity. In a sense, scientific conservatism as a normative shaping principle is a form of Occam's razor. Only in the case of all things being equal can we prefer the simpler hypothesis. In this case, all things aren't equal because ID theory is the only theory that contains the essential ingredient necessary to accomplish the explanatory task. Though conservatism is a sensible approach to take, the history of science shows that sometimes science is forced to make drastic changes. The biological data is now pushing us to make the change from naturalism to a design heuristic. Aside from material mechanisms, perhaps scientists should frame biological mechanism in terms of an irreducible teleology. Kapersky points out that scientists use concepts of teleology quite freely now. This is true to some extent. There are scientists who don't have a problem with teleological language. For example, in the field of systems biology, there does seem to be an increasing acceptance of teleological and design language. To what extent this language is supposed to be literal or metaphorical, it's difficult to tell. But many other bi biologists think this language is highly objectionable and believe it to not be a proper part of science. So there's a live debate going on in this area about the validity of design language in biology. So teleological language is used freely in some areas but still frowned upon in others. Simon Conway Morris is one scientist that sees a purposeful pattern in evolutionary convergence, for example. Kapersky contends that more modest, general theories of teleology are consistent with design, yet advocates of traditional ID refuse to include these ideas within their theories. I'm not sure this is true. It's not that they don't want to include these ideas, but it's that they aren't a replacement for it. William Dembski has had some personal interaction with Conway Morris on this point and has stated that in principle scientists like him aren't excluded but the problem is notions of irreducible teleology aren't rigorous enough to tell us much about design. They don't go far enough. Any view that holds that design is empirically detectable can be welcomed as a scientific theory of design but it's unclear how Conway Morris's view can actually be said to detect design. Of course, these things need to be cashed out probabilistically, but how does one go from observations of evolutionary convergence and fine-tuning of the fitness landscape to a design inference? What is it about those observations that tip us off to design? Dembski would say it's complex specified information that's the key. Conway Morris doesn't see his teleological view as a scientific inference anyway, and that's fine. Arguments to design from metaphysics or a theology of nature are of course quite acceptable, and we can gain real knowledge from these approaches, but they don't give us much empirical meat on which to build a scientific research program. Is it too restrictive to insist that design must be empirically detectable? I don't think design theorists argue that it must be, rather that it is detectable and raises interesting research questions for the scientific community. Though Conway Morris and Dembski have their disagreements, they aren't as opposed as they may seem. Kapersky writes that if ID really is about science, why not opt for a bigger tent, even if it's occupied with those of less conservative theology? 
but ID doesn't necessarily exclude the theistic evolutionists. Views like those of Simon Conway Morris are, as Dembski allows, perfectly consistent with ID. But consistency isn't enough for a scientific theory. The tent is open, but whether or not theistic evolutionists like Conway Morris want to step inside is another question. In this video, I've argued that the observations that design theorists have drawn attention to are leading us to change our understanding of nature. And far from violating sensible scientific protocol and making a larger than necessary leap, it allows us to understand far more about the natural world. There is a better alternative on the table. And at first, it may seem like a drastic shift in our comfortable naturalism, but it adds a necessary step in our explanatory toolbox. If design is restricted from science, we will sadly be forced to stick with a limited view of the natural world. We should seek the truth, even if it feels uncomfortable.